In this video series, you'll learn how to use a model-based design approach to develop radio frequency applications for the Xilinx RF SOC platform. In part two, we looked at a real-world example application developed a range Doppler radar system with RF SOC. We saw how to take high-level specifications and use that to make system-level engineering decisions using modeling and simulation. Part three, We'll continue with the range Doppler radar example and evaluate different hardware software partitioning strategies using a mix of simulation and hardware profiling based analysis. So after we've determined our system specifications and parameters, the next step of the process here is to partition our algorithm between hardware and software. And the first step in that process is to understand exactly what the algorithm is doing and elaborate it, right? We need to know what's going on under the hood so that we can intelligently assign the different processing blocks between the FPGA and processor. And so we saw in the previous model I showed, there's a range Doppler response block, which was producing that, that plot we saw. This is our processed range Doppler output. The MATLAB source code is actually available for that block. If you double click and bring up the block parameters, it will bring you to a source code link. So you can see exactly what the MATLAB code is that's, that's used to implement it under the hood. And so this is extremely helpful with elaborating your high level functions into the low level processing blocks that you actually need to implement. We can look at a model here that I've created as part of this algorithm elaboration step. All right, so it actually looks pretty similar to the previous model. We have our waveform coming in, linear FM, same as before. We're plugging into our same radar target model because this is a model reference, we can just reuse it. But then this range Doppler processing block is, is slightly different. What I've done is add a MATLAB function block which implements the range Doppler response block, uh, re-implements it in basic MATLAB code, All right? And so again, I looked under the hood of that range Doppler response block, and what you'll find here is it's really only two basic operations taking place. We have a match filter operation given by this filter command, where the coefficients are the uh, waveform in reverse, and then we take the filter output and plug that through an FFT. So filters and FFTs, very common processing blocks in, in DSP applications. And that's really, that's all that's going on here in terms of the range Doppler processing. So then we can instantiate our MATLAB version of that block in parallel with the reference and then simulate them together, right? And so we see visually the output looks the same, right? Here's our two targets. Uh, but more importantly, we can numerically compare the outputs and make sure they're exactly the same, right? Because we want to make sure that we account for all the details here, that we are doing the exact same thing as it's what's going on under the hood here. And so we use this assertion block. This is comparing that my reference and my own implementation are indeed the same. And so this is a really valuable exercise to go through just to understand here more about things like the data sizes and types, um, you know, what are the underlying operations here that you're going to need to implement. And so after having done that algorithm elaboration step, we can take our analysis a bit further here and think about the, the way that the data is coming into our system, right? So we have a range samples for a, for a given pulse and we integrate multiple pulse intervals here to form up a, a matrix of samples. We saw that on the range dimension, we're computing a match filter. And one thing to uh, glean here is that the range computation can be performed immediately as the data comes in from the ADC. We don't have to put it anywhere. We can just stream those samples directly to a filter as they come in. Now on the pulse interval dimension, we are computing an FFT. And the thing to notice here is that the entire frame needs to be present before we can start doing that FFT, right? So we need to put all these range samples somewhere in the meantime until we formed up the whole matrix and then we can start processing the FFT. And so now here we're, we're going to lay out two possible approaches for how to partition this processing chain, right? So we have three basic blocks, our match filter and an FFT and then detection, which is that 2 dc far. We're going to leave that, that out of this analysis for now. Really just consider 
the partitioning of the match filter in FFT. So we have option A is to do those first two processing steps uh, all on the FPGA. And option B, we'll do just the match filter on the FPGA and do the FFT on the arm. And so let's look at some ways that we can analyze the various options here. So for the first option, again, that is the FFT taking place on the FPGA. Uh, let's consider the size of our data matrix, right? So we have up to 4096 range samples times 512 pulses per CPI at 24 bits per sample, right? We have IQ 12 bits. Uh, that's 48 megabits of data to store that whole matrix. And a simple approach uh, would be to just store it all on block RAM on the device. That would make accessing it very easy. Doesn't have to leave the chip. But we look here at our product table and, and for the ZU28DR device that's on the, the board we're targeting, uh, we see we have 38 megabit of block RAM, right? So fortunately, that's too much data to fit uh, completely on chip. So what that means is we have to store it temporarily in external DDR4, right? So we're gonna write the data to DDR in order as it comes in after the match filter, and then later read it out from DDR in transposed order uh, as we access the range dimension for the FFT. And so storing the data off chip is, is going to invoke uh, another level of analysis we need to perform here. And that's basically how long is it going to take to do this operation of, of storing off chip in external memory and then reading it out in transposed order. Now, this would be something that would, would take some decent amount of engineering time to go and, and measure in hardware. But one thing we can do is actually simulate this using the memory controller and, and memory traffic generator blocks from SOC Blocks and Simulink. And so my model here does that. We have a write traffic generator, which is simulating our in-order write operation, and then the read traffic generator does the transposed read operation. And so after running simulation, I'll double click here on this memory controller block. And um, first thing I wanna point out here is we have our hardware board here, the Z ZCU111 kit, right? So what that means is we've characterized the memory controller on that board specifically and populated some behavioral parameters here so that we're actually simulating the memory interface specific to that board, right? So after running simulation, can bring up this performance plot. I'm going to plot the bandwidth over simulation time for, for master one and master two, which are my write traffic and read traffic respectively. And so what we're going to see here is that the in-order write operation is uh, happens very quickly, right? We, we get a, a maximum bandwidth here of 500 megabytes per second. But the read operation uh, is very slow. So we, we only get up to about 25 megabytes per second. And the reason for that is because the data is stored in memory out of order, right? So we have to read words one at a time, whereas the in-order write operation can be really fast because we can use large burst lengths. And so putting that together, we see a, a total time estimate here for this transpose operation with DDR about 438 milliseconds, All right? So that's, that's just a metric we're to keep in mind as the result of analyzing this option A. Now for option B, so if we think about the, again, the, the size of our data here, this, this 4096 by 512 matrix we're dealing with. So what are we actually doing? It's, it's the FFT length is 512, and we have to do that 4096 times. And one way we can speed this operation up is actually take advantage of the quad core ARM processor inside the processing system and then distribute the workload between the four cores in order to get a four times speed up versus doing it on one core, right? So we compute the FFT for range bins one through 1024 on core one and so on divided between the four cores, right? And then finally gather the full uh, output frame. Now to analyze the timing of this, you know, we, we there's different ways you could 
try and kind of estimate just based on the, the algorithm how long this would take. But really the, the best thing to do here is to go and measure it on the hardware itself. It's actually really easy to do using uh, a tool called Processor in the Loop, uh, which lets us do profiling on the device and actually measure the real numbers, right? So that's going to be the most accurate way to do it, of course. And it turns out it, it's, it's really easy to do using Simulink. And so we'll, we'll open up our processor in the loop model here. And so you can see I have some, some test input here, which is 1024 by 512 matrix. Again, that's the, you know, one quarter of the full 4096 by 512 matrix. Dig in here, I've got my reference model doing the transpose, do a data type conversion from in 16 to floating point single so that we can take advantage of the floating point neon instructions. And then we got an FFT block here. Right, which is with embedded coder, this is already going to generate target optimized code for the arm that takes advantage of that floating point engine. And so it's a really simple model to build up. I'm going to run this and you'll note here with this PIL notation here, it's going to run this target model reference using generated code on the actual hardware target. And so uh, what it's doing now is compiling that and we're going to go out and run it and return the timing results. And so when that finishes running, uh, we'll get this uh, profiling report back. And so we can dig into that. And what we'll see is that on average it takes about 476 milliseconds to process that frame on one core. Right? And so the FFT takes up most of that, but we account for the, the other, the memory transpose and data type conversion as well. And so now we can compare some numbers here between option A and option B, right? So we saw using simulation based estimate that the FPGA FFT would take about 438 milliseconds to complete. Whereas the software based FFT we measured was about 476 milliseconds. But latency is not the only factor to consider. Right, the FPGA based FFT we saw would require some additional complexity here with actually writing the control logic to store that data in memory and read it out trans in a transposed order. Whereas the software based FFT was really simple to build using Simulink and generate already target optimized C code. So we're gonna go with option B here. We'll take a little bit of latency hit at the trade-off of it being a, a simpler path forward for now. Uh, we can always revisit and, and go back later if we determine that the latency numbers aren't acceptable, but uh, we're going to go with the software-based FFT based on our analysis. All right, so now we move into the design and implementation phase where we're integrating our hardware, software, and interface together using that partitioning scheme that we came up with. And so here's a model that does that. Right, so we have our, our radar target model, same one that we've been using in the previous models. Here's our FPGA subsystem, uh, right, and this contains the, the match filter block. And that is streaming data here through our DMA memory channel. Right, This will place the data in a shared DDR to be read out by the processor later. And so inside the processor subsystem, you can see we've partitioned out the processing into these four separate tasks. Right, And so we, these are going to run on the four different cores of that ARM processor. All right, so I'll go ahead and run the model. And there's a couple things to point out here. So we can bring in here our displays, right? So one thing we're seeing here is the effect of quantization, right? So I'm simulating the ADC and DAC quantization and the effect that has in bringing the, the noise floor up, right? And we can also look at the memory controller here. And what we'll see, like we'd expect here, master one, right? This is the FPGA writing data in memory. We see the same almost 500 uh, megabyte per second bandwidth, which matches, again, what we saw with the model we were using to, to test the performance of the transpose operation. But here, the FPGA just sending the, the output of the 
filter into memory, right? We get a really high bandwidth achieved here of 500 megabytes per second. And then uh, another thing we can look at here on the processor side, So we can actually simulate the uh, latency of the processing tasks and plug in the, the timing information that we gathered using the processor and the loop profiling. And so we'll see that here. So I'm going to plot the runtime of each of my tasks. Remember, I had four different data tasks, right? And so I'll plot those four separately. They all run for the same amount of time. We can see that the result isn't available until the end of this, right? So so regular Simulink blocks execute with uh, zero duration, right? We can actually simulate the, or incorporate the, the timing of your software into your system level simulation, right? And that lets you characterize the latency of your, of your system as a whole by incorporating those software timing effects. This concludes part three of the video series. In part four, we'll show how to generate C and HDL code for the range Doppler radar algorithm and automate the deployment of our prototype design to the Xilinx ZCU-111 development kit.